everybody. I want to do start my rock stars of psychology series today, and I wanted to kick it off with who I think is the rock god of psychology, who was Stanley Milgram. Now, Stanley Milgram is sadly not with us anymore. He died quite young, but he was an American psychologist, and he did a fantastic study called the Obedience Study. And I suppose it's considered by many psychologists to be one of the most influential studies of the last maybe 60 or 70 years. Um, the 2009 replication by Jerry Berger was designed to see if obedience rates were similar in the early 21st century. And we're going to talk about that a little later. But let me talk about the obedience studies first. Stanley Milgram, he wanted to conduct an experiment studying obedience to authority and find out why that during the Second World War and the Holocaust, seemingly ordinary people could perpetrate such horrible evil acts on each other against their better judgment when ordered to by an authority figure. And that's the crux of this, when ordered to by an authority figure, because the authority figure was a variable in the experiment that was absolutely crucial. And Milgram was very smart. I'll, I'll explain briefly what the actual method was and what the design of the experiment was, should I say. Um, so there were three people involved. There were usually men in the first series of experiments, kind of middle-aged men. Um, the participant of the study would act as a teacher. And he would ask questions of a learner who was termed the confederate, was being monitored and prompted by an experimenter who was posing as the authority figure. Now, the experimenter wore a long white coat, and it was a laboratory experiment. So the experimenter already was performing the identity of an authority figure, a scientist, as it were, um, whose authority could not be questioned. And it turns out that during the experiments, a high percentage of people did not question what they were asked to do. And as I go on, you'll see what they were asked to do was sometimes not very pleasant. Now, the questions the participant asked were matching word pairs that had to be learnt by the learner and then tested, with the teacher testing the learner who sat in the adjacent room by intercom. So you had the participant who was the teacher, the learner who was in another room with a microphone and headphones and all that, and the uh, participant would be uh, asking them, uh, so for example, the participant would say, bird, and the matching word might be cage, and then the learner would have to remember what the matching word was. Now, this is the crux of it. For each incorrect answer that the learner gave, an electric shock was administered. The learner had been strapped up before the experiment with a, uh, on a chair and their arm had been strapped up with an electric shock device. And every time they got something wrong, they got shocked. Now, there was a tiny little shock given to the, um, to the teacher prior to the experiment to show them that there was a real electric shock. But the actual learner wasn't getting real shocks, but the teacher didn't know this. So the participant didn't know that the learner wasn't getting real shocks. The learner was simply a confederate, an actor, acting out these uh, shock, uh, um, acting out being shocked. So the shock generator was the apparatus they used, and it started at 15 volts, and it moved up to 450 volts. Now, I, you know, I'm not an expert on electric shocks, but 450 volts is a big shock, and that's going to be something that could possibly kill you. So it went from 15 up to 450 volts. The confederate learners recorded cries of pain, would increase on each shock. And it was very, very well scripted so that it would be a, a very controlled experiment. They had it, They had the learner down to a T in terms of what they would say. I can't do this anymore. Take it off me. It's too painful. And the teacher, the participant, would be listening to this and then being prompted on by the experimenter in the lab coat who was the authority figure. Now, the teacher was advised by the experiment in the room that the shocks were punishments and that the teacher must continue until the, all the answers were correct. And the entire experiment, as I say, was scripted, and this would avoid any confounding variables, uh, such as the intensity of the cries of the pain or the strength of the experimenter's prompts. The pro experimenter also had really, really clear prompts that they had to give. Um, Milgram's method was very detailed, and beautifully, it, lend itself, it lends itself to replication so well, because it's all written down. You got the book. I don't know if anybody's read the book, but Stanley Milgram's Obedience to Authority, it details the experiments and the subsequent variations of the experiment, which went on through the 1960s and 70s. It's fantastic. Please read it. 
especially if you're an early psycholo psychology student. So anyway, it's a gift for anybody who wants to replicate the experiment. Unfortunately, it's not re replicatable because you would never get it passed by the ethics committees of either the American Psychological Association or the British Psychological Society. They're never going to pass it because the distress it caused to the actual participant thinking that he was shocking an innocent person uh, would it be too much. And it was too much in this experiment. Um, so Milgram's method was detailed. It lent itself well to replication. It was meticulously planned. And um, the dependent variable, of course, in this case, was the electric shocks that the teacher would administer. So that was what the measure was. They wanted to measure how far they would go. And contrary to many hypotheses and opinions given in the pre-experiment qualitative surveys, where they were asking people, how far do you think people will go? You know, people, when they were asked, would say, well, they probably go as, maybe as far as 100, maybe 75, but I don't think anybody would shock anybody beyond 75 volts. But it's totally contradicted. By the end of the experiment, and wait for it, 26 out of 40 participants administered the maximum 450 volts. Even when the learner had gone quiet. So they'd been screaming in pain going up the ranks of the volts, 15, 30, 45, um, 60, 75. And then when it got into the hundreds, they'd be screaming 200, 300, etc. And they would be roaring with pain and saying, please stop, please stop. And the experimenter would be saying, no, he has to learn it. If he gets it wrong, you have to shock him. And he would be using prompts like, it's absolutely imperative that you continue. So these were really strong prompts to give the, exper to give the experimenter to, to, uh, to give to the, uh, to the learner, to, to the teacher, should I say. So now, um, of course, I said a minute ago it wasn't really replicatable, but Berger, Jerry Berger in 2009 decided they could replicate it. If they could pass it on the ethics, if they only brought the shocks as far as, I think it was 150 volts. Let me just check my notes to that. Yeah, because while Jerry Berger was researching Milgram's results, he, he gleaned that most people who disobeyed the experimenter, or who said, look, I'm not doing this anymore. They left the experiment before the 150 volt mark. However, 79% of people who went beyond 150 volts went all the way to 450 volts. So Berger hypothesized that, okay, we can generally agree that if anybody goes beyond the 150 volts, based on Milgram's experiments, we can assume that they would have gone to the 450 volts. It's not ideal, but it's a pretty good replication. So he didn't want to only partially replicate it, but he wanted to move Milgram's work forward. Um, and he put other uh, variables in, like a second confederate learner who would disobey to see if that would influence the other um, learner. And that he wanted to see the impact of that on the participant. So he was particularly detailed in repl replicating Milgram's experiment. He used the exact same words in the memory test, the same experimenter's prompts, and even the same lab coat. Um, but like Milgram, a sample shock was given at the very beginning. So everything he did was exactly the way Milgram did it. But unlike Milgram, the participants were told, as is always the case now in experiments, that they could withdraw at any time. Um, and Berger was informed of this three times. He gave that three times to people before the experiment that they could withdraw at any time. Now, Although Milgram concluded that the situation was a more important factor than the personality when they were determining, determining obedience levels, Berger explored certain personality attributes, namely empathy and the need to control events. But by the end of his findings, he too concluded, like Milgram, that situation was the domineering factor, showing, like Milgram, that when individuals were in a lower hierarchical position than an authority figure, they may lose empathy and compassion. Uh, Berger's results are very similar to Milgram's in terms of obedience levels. So this is a fascinating study because really what it, what it shows us is that we all consider ourselves to be fair-minded people who would come to the assistance of someone who was being tortured or bullied. But the environment has a very, very, very important impact and our perception of authority is very, very powerful. 
I read some other books actually about this. I read Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. I don't know if you've ever read it. Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. It's about the Holocaust. It's about a battalion of men who were just ordinary policemen before the Second World War. And they weren't um, sort of indoctrinated into Hitler's ideologies. They were possibly social democrats or part of the Communist Party or the Catholic Party in Germany um, before Hitler came to power. And um, so they weren't like real Hitler, stalwart Hitler fans. And of course, when Hitler came in, they were told that they had to be part of a battalion who would execute Jewish people. And they had to do it in terrible ways, but they're bringing people, women, children, and men into the forest and shooting them in the back of the head. It was awful. And of course, these guys were not used to this. They were not used to this level of horror. And even their battalion leader was really reluctant to do it. But, you know, after some time, sadly, it became second nature to them. And they began to enjoy it. Some of them, not all of them. And they began to go on what they call Jew hunts. And, and you know, even outside of being kind of the normal um, day's work for them. They were kind of doing it like it was a hobby. But there were some um, men in the battalion, and it was a very small number, who resisted the authority. And I managed to avoid killing anybody. And I found that absolutely overwhelming, that there were these, it was a very small number. It could have even been maybe three or four people who managed to go for that whole period, I mean, it was, I think it was something like two or three years, without killing anybody. And they were often disobedient to the authorities, saying they couldn't do it. But they also found other ways of avoiding it by hiding in the forest and just using ingenious ways of avoiding it. And um, I don't know if they were interviewed after the war, but I imagine their consciences are, are far in a much better state than the people who acted out those horrible atrocities. So that's a brilliant book, Ordinary Men, and it really, it really just uh, emphasizes the importance of the situation, which Milgram was really trying to get at. He was saying, look, we all think we're fair people. Um, we all think we'd be the good Samaritan. We all think we'd be Oscar Schindler. But in the wrong environment, with authority, with an authority we consider to be an expert and have authority over us, and if this person tells us what to do, then we'll do it. And so I found that really fascinating. Of course, after reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Milden, William Shirer, which is another unbelievably brilliant account of Hitler's rise to power from his childhood, right? I'm only halfway through it, actually, the bookmark in there. Um, you see the power of Hitler's personality, um, which is quite overwhelming. And you, when, you, when you read it, you realize that this man had such an, uh, an incredible charisma, and not a good one, obviously, an infamous way, but um, the power he had over people. So one person can really make a, an incredible difference, positively, and in his case, obviously, very negatively on an environment. Um, now, Milgram, what I found very interesting is in 2013, I can't remember the psychologist's name, I think it was Gibson, did a, a rhetorical analysis of Milgram's experiment. And he listened to recordings and transcribed them. I think there were hidden recordings of later experiments that Milgram did, or even some of the early ones. And he found that people weren't always as obedient as Milgram made, out, made them out to be, that there was a lot of rhetoric going on. Um, the learner would say to the experimenter, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to torture this guy. The guy's in pain. I'm not going to do this anymore. And, and then the, 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 the experimenter would respond to this rhetoric by acting out going in and saying okay I'll go in and check on him and I'll see if he's okay and he would come out and he would say yeah he's okay we can keep going so it was all play acting but it showed that people weren't as obedient as Milgram perhaps made out that there were a lot of participants who questioned the authority of the experimenter by using this rhetoric so that's a very interesting study that Gibson from 2013 um I'd have to look that up, actually, because I'd like to be able to talk about that in a later vlog. Some things come to my mind, and I haven't got them in my notes, so I can't give you the exact names and dates. But Milgram's experiment, fantastic. If you can get to read it. If you're an early psychology student, you'll have done it in your first year. And if you're about to embark on a psychology degree, you'll do it. You'll do it very early on. As I say, it can't be replicated. It's totally unethical. But Berger's replication is, is excellent, and I think it would be great to see further replications, maybe using a rhetorical analysis perspective to see um, how using rhetoric uh, and language can change the participants behavior. As I say, Milgram did conduct various um, 
uh, different um, varial variabilities of the experiment down the years, and he would have the um, experimenter not wearing a lab coat and wearing a suit, which did have a difference in whether people obeyed, make a difference. And also he had the experimenter leaving and coming back again. So when the, when the participant as teacher was left alone, they behaved totally different. He also had another variable where he put the actual learner beside the teacher in the same room so that they had physical contact. And that was very interesting because they were less likely to shock them if they were face to face. So they had, uh, but, but then other people who were put beside the learner <laughs> had sort of psychopathic tendencies that were grabbing their learner's hand and pushing it onto the shock generator and seeming to be enjoying it. So there were personality effects as well. So look, that's all I've got to say about my first uh, rock star of psychology vlog. I'm hoping to do Philip Zimbardo next. So thank you for watching and please like and subscribe.